Hello, everybody. I hope you've gotten those dragon egg pictures completed. Um, I'm filming this the same day as the first one, so I have no idea if you're going to send me something. So please surprise me and send out some pictures when you get the opportunity. Our second class, as you can see from the instruction sheet, is called Sea Serpents. I might add to the name and call it Sea Serpents and Friends. There's a lot of different things out there. The word serpent means large snake. We have large snakes that we encounter once in a while. Fortunately, here in the Midwest, not too many times. I scream when I see a garter snake in the yard. But large snakes like boa constrictors, anacondas, and cobras, which I think they're found in India. I'm not an expert, but I'm positive we don't have those around here. So that's a good thing. So today's class is going to introduce you to mythological serpents that are classified as dragons by many sources, although I did find in one book, that Dragonology book that I like so well. This one. It's right side up, okay. They're telling me that it, they're not dragons because dragons breathe fire and serpents don't. Dragons fly and serpents don't, although there is a flying serpent, but that's another whole thing. Serpents are found in water and dragons are land creatures or they like to fly over land. Serpents are attracted to wooden ships, but dragons are attracted to treasure, which they like to hoard. And who doesn't like to hoard treasure? But serpents don't do that. But in spite of what that book says, in this class we are going to consider mythological serpents as being dragons. And other books say that they are, other sources. Um, there's a book that I found that I like very much. I don't know if you're familiar with this one. It is called Arthur Spiderwick's Field Guide to the Fantastical World Around You. And the illustrator in this book, absolutely fantastic. Um, his name is Tony D. Terlizzi, sounds Italian to me. I hope I'm saying it right, Tony. Fantastic um, drawings in here. He has, uh, even has a bookmark. I love books with bookmarks, don't you? Then I don't have to find a stray piece of paper. But there's some writing about sea serpents. It says they're the scourge of the high sea, powerful, massive, flat heads, bodies that coil around whales and ships, crushing their ribs. In shallow water, sea serpents may curl up and wait for their prey. In deeper water, they swim in an undulating manner, and it's back and forth, like an eel, but certain species swim with their bodies vertical to the surface, disguising themselves to look like much smaller fish. Crushed pieces of boats washed ashore are possible signs of a sea serpent and look for hooked teeth that are too large for a shark or a long shedding of skin in the shape of a tube. Once in a while I find those in the yard from garter snakes and they still give me goosebumps. So this is a cool book. It's also one that's a little harder to manage because you have to unfold pages, harder to take care of. But this is a very large picture of a sea serpent. So check out that book if you can find it. There's a very old book you might have heard of before that mentions sea serpents. It's called the Bible, and it talks about leviathans. So it's even that far back, several thousand years ago, that there are the mention of sea monsters. A more modern book, this one I think was printed maybe in Scotland, is Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. You might have heard about Nessie. Um, it, this tells the whole history about the Loch Ness Monster. It was first spotted by a man in the year 565 AD, which is way back. Monks, religious people, um, a particular monk named St. Columba spotted one. And then the other monks at the abbey where he lived kept track of future sightings. Then much, much later, in 1934, a surgeon was driving past the Loch and Loch is a Scottish word for lake, so Loch Ness Monster is lake monster, saw something and he took a photo. It's a very blurry photo. You can find it on the internet. Um, they said later on it turned out to be a hoax or bogus or fake news as they call it now. 
but it's interesting to see that photograph. Even before Nessie was spotted, there were sightings of other sea monsters. Somewhere between the year 130 and 51 BC, Posidonius, a philosopher, reported to having seen the corpse of a fallen dragon that had washed up on the coast of Southwest Asia. Then in 1734, Hans Egede, the national saint of Greenland, described a terrible creature that was longer than the whole ship he was riding on. In 1848, a captain of the HMS Daedalus and several of his crew spotted a sea serpent between the Cape of Good Hope, that's at the base of Africa, and St. Helena. One of the officers said it was more of a lizard than a serpent. And these are just a few of possible sightings that have happened in history. Now I want to show you what I'm going to call sea monster art. This first one is a frieze that's like a mural made out of stone from the late 8th century BC. Um, the King Sargon was on a Mediterranean voyage to Cyprus between 720 and 705 BC and he claimed that he spotted this. In the picture you can see Phoenician boats, they're loading up lumber at the top is the sea serpent, and it must be pretty big, or the turtle is pretty big next to it, but it was thought to be a very large sea serpent. In Norway, there was a man who was a cartographer. Cartographer makes maps. His name is Olus Magnus. Um, he vividly um, described, he, somebody vividly described what they saw to him on their travels around Scandinavia. Latin legend said this critter was 300 feet long. The map shows, uh, writes that it's only 200 feet long. You see the sea orm, as it's called. It's coiled around a Norwegian ship devouring a crew member. So we know what it likes to eat, don't we? It's over in here. It lives in rocks and caves. It has hair hanging from its neck, uh, a foot and a half long, kind of like now people aren't getting out to get their hair cut. He had a really long, uh, amount of hair on the side and very sharp scales. Now Magnus describes it as a black serpent, but he painted it in as red. So I'm not sure why, couldn't find the answer. But he also said that it had flaming, shining eyes. Magnus said it would signify changes like the death of a prince or an impending war. This is another picture of Magnus um, drawings from his maps, different sea monsters, and he put it all together. It's called a compilation when you put a bunch of pictures together from the year 1539. In 1600, Giovanni Andrea Maglioli, sounds Italian to me, this is an engraving of sea serpents. An engraving is where you carve into a plate you put ink on it, you wipe off the extra stuff that doesn't go in the little lines that you've carved, and then you run the plate through a printing press. This looks to me like there are two of them together, as I see two heads, and I see four wings. At first I thought it might be two-headed, but when I see four wings, I think it must be just two of them together. This one is an unusual piece because it's a man called St. George slaying a dragon. Now, this usually happened in medieval times when dragons had legs, but this is a sea serpent, so it's very unusual. It was found in a book, in a manuscript, and he's not using a sword. It looks like he's using a scythe that people cut grass with. A very large sea serpent. Here's the maiden in distress, the damsel in distress. He's there trying to save her from this serpent. I wanted to show you this one because I think he's kind of funny. It's from 1817. It was the sighting of the Gloucester Sea Serpent in August 1817. And they continued to see sightings of this one for the next two years. I like the way he's drawn. He's a little bit easier to draw. Um, lots of triangular shaped scales. So there are different ways to draw scales. But this might be an easier one for some of you to draw if you're having difficulty with more intricate drawings. This is a, a detail from a painting of one of my favorite artists. His name is Joseph Mallard Turner. It was, came to be known as Sunrise with Sea Monsters. I'm kind of peering around because when I, I'm putting this up here so you can see the whole thing, but then, hey, I can't see what I'm doing. So now and then I'm kind of peeking over the picture. 
but it's very kind of indistinct. Um, one article I read said it could just be fish. I like to think it's sea monsters in here. It was painted in 1845 and the painting was never finished. Then we move into 1881 and this is Sea Serpents on the Gulf. Um, it's an illustration of an alleged sea serpent that was spotted by Mr. R.C. Renard. He said this is what he saw off the coast of South America. Excuse me, it was in 1881. And back then in some of the news things in newspapers, they used a lot of those prints or engravings rather than photography. It's just what they were used to doing. I don't actually know when photography became more popular, but people used to use drawings and prints in some of the newspapers. And here, back in 1904, we have a sea serpent created by Arthur Rackham, who was a very popular illustrator at that time, did um, illustrations for children's books, um, magazines, that sort of thing. This is called Young Girl Riding a Sea Serpent. It may have been a book illustration. I couldn't find out the source, but you can see there's a girl clinging to this thing. I hope she knows what she's doing because it looks like a rather fierce sea serpent to me. And another Arthur Rack Rackham that I like, it was a 1908 illustration. This one is called Leviathan. Um, it was an inspiration for something that we did here at the library a number of years ago. I don't remember the year. I used to write on the back when I did them. But this was Leviathan. If you shake it, it doesn't have a motion, a motor. You just have to shake it. But this one doesn't look nearly as terrifying. He's made out of a paper plate. So um, if you have paper plates around the house, you might want to experiment and do a three-dimensional art project. But he did this illustration for a Shakespeare um, play called A Midsummer Night's Dream. I like Shakespeare. And he wrote, Ere the Leviathan can swim a league. So I guess they're good in the water. The last art picture to show you is from this Nessie book. I made an enlargement of it because I think it's a little easier to draw. It's a little more cartoon-like. The man who wrote the book and illustrated it, that means the author and the illustrator, is Richard Brassy. And you can see this is one of those pictures where part of the sea serpent is submerged. So it's just bumps above the water and then the water painted in. I suppose if the water was clear, you'd see more of it. But I was thinking, what if we had one of these in the Mississippi River? It, it's pretty muddy looking in places. So all you'd have to do is paint and draw this and then some kind of dirty looking river water. On a nice day, it's a little more blue, but not always. So those are some artworks that I wanted you to see that show different artists' interpretations of sea monsters. And hey, nobody really knows if that one photo that exists of Nessie is a fake, who knows? But then that water is very deep. It said the Loch Ness, the Loch where it lives, is deep enough that you could stack up five jets wing tip to wing tip and the water would still be deeper. I kind of prefer a wading pool myself, but so that sounds like really, really deep water. Um, today's drawing project, you're going to need the second illustration page. You will need a sheet of paper that has a W on it because that means you can use water if you choose. You'll want a D piece of paper for drawing if you want to do some sketching. Um, and so that's what you're going to be needing. So I want you to go ahead and get your materials together if you don't already have them together. Your pencils may need sharpening from last week. You want to keep some, you want to make the point with points. So keep your pencil sharpened. Remember how I told you to sharpen it. Turn the sharpener, not the pencil. Take a look at that illustration sheet. And I don't think I have mine out yet. Um, I'm going to have to get that out here. On that sheet, you're going to see a number of sea monsters. When I put these together, I wanted to pick different kinds of pictures in different poses. Um, here's that one that the gentleman said that he saw off the coast of South America. I don't know who did a lot of these. This is a very old one. But they're basically snakes with fancy heads, is how I'm going to describe them. I like the shape of this one. This is what I started to use for my project. I like it because it's in the shape of a backwards letter S. 
And if you can write, if you can print, you certainly can do an S shape. I think that's going to be OK. So I started out just with that kind of shape. I have to do a little bit more of a turn here. Okay. I'll make this darker as I go, too. So I started out with an S shape. Now, snakes, there, I think you can see that one now. Snakes, they're kind of sort of the same thickness, almost down to the point of the tail. I say kind of, sort of, because I usually don't get close enough to really, really know. Um, in this picture that I was looking at, it is getting thicker here, but that could be because it's closer to the viewer. It's something called one-point perspective that means when you're close to something, it looks bigger than when it's far away. Um, I teach that to kids. I guess I don't have an example of something I can do here. But the farther away you are from something, the tinier it looks. And if you're outside and you're looking at a building, use your thumb and your forefinger and measure how big it looks. And then get closer to it. And you're going to see that your fingers are going to get wider apart because something looks bigger as you get closer to it. That's something called perspective, and it was done in the Middle Ages when people were really getting into drawing and they wanted things to look more realistic. So I think that's part of the reason that this critter looks the way that it does. Now my S shape, I'm going to modify it, I'm going to alter it a little bit because I had this part a little too thick up here. I'm going to make this a little smaller because I need to draw in the head and the thickness of the snake. When I look at this and I want to break it down a little bit, I see kind of a rectangular shape here. So just to gear my brain for the right shape, I'm going to put that in, although that doesn't really look like that, does it? Then I'm going to make this thicker. OK. Too thick. It's OK to erase. What I forgot to do, and I'm going to mention it to you, when you're looking at something to draw, you've got something called a positive space, and that's our Mr. Snake here. And then you've got a negative space, which is the air around it. And when I'm having trouble drawing things, Sometimes I think about this shape and how big it is. And when I'm looking at this shape, I see that it's more like well, sometimes these work and sometimes they don't. It's a little more like this, kind of like a horseshoe. So I modified it. Now I have to make the body over here. Now the body stops here because there's water flowing over it. So that's okay. It makes for an interesting picture to have it kind of start and stop there so that I put the water in. So that doesn't look much like a snake right now, but it's the start of the shape. Now the mouth. The mouth I see as a V shape here. So I'm just going to start with a V. It's starting to look a little more snake-like. Then up where the eye is, there's a bump. Making sure you can see that. Looks like you can. The nose doesn't come to a point like that. The nose has a bump here, kind of like an alligator. I'm going to put a nostril there. I don't know that I see a nostril there, but I feel better about it. Okay. I'm going to get rid of that part of the box. I'm going to start putting in these points. I'm going to draw in that eye. And the eye can give all kinds of impressions about how your dragon is feeling. It can get maybe skinnier, maybe an eyelid. Maybe the pupil is bigger. Now I need to change the end of this and not make it so pointed, make it a little more rounded. And he's got one horrible tongue sticking out here. I wonder what it is he's thinking of having for lunch. OK, I remember reading that the description 
of one of those dragons, I think it's this one, they described it as having just a mouthful of very sharp pointed teeth. So I've given it my teeth over here, not my teeth. I wish I had teeth like that sometimes. I've given it its teeth. The little part of the inside of the mouth here, I'm just going to fill in a little bit, just because I feel better about making it look three-dimensional. Um, an interesting part around the mouth here, I don't know what this is all about, but I'm going to draw it in because they have it here. And there's a little gill here, because they are, they are ocean creatures, so they probably have to have gills somewhere. Okay, let's get rid of some of these creepy eyes, too many creepy eyes. Okay, we've got more of these pointy things here. I'm sure they have another name other than pointy things here. I'm just kind of winging it here. I don't want to be too slow and have this drag on too long, so been waiting to use that one. And in each one of these little points, it's kind of like bat wings, I see little, little veins happening here. Just kind of making it up as I go here. I'm not always looking at the picture. I think that looks a lot more like a sea serpent now. I don't know what you think, what your opinion is. Now, the body that I've got here still is not quite thick enough to satisfy me. I'm looking at my negative space here again. And this comes out way out here. Yep, okay. Okay. I have part of this drawn. There's more to it. You've got another part of the dragon coming up through the water here. You've got more of these pointy things. You've got another part that's over here. You have to just imagine you can see the rest of it. You know it's under the water. But, but this is the basic part of it. So there would be more to draw, lots and lots of sca scales. But I want to show you what I did with the water part then next. Okay, you've had a chance to look at that very fast drawing with this. This is what I started to put on my paper with the W, because I know I can use water. So what I did with this was, first I sketched it like this, I refined it, I'm still kind of in the process of it. When I had the drawing the way that I like it, because it's best to, to do this in stages, I mean you can come back and and tweak a few things, but it's a little difficult to erase some of this stuff, so I like to get the drawing before I do the water. I did a sample here to let you know, or show you what I did first. When I started to color in the body of it, I colored in first, I used violet and black. I had my violet handy here, but I had my black. And I used those two colors together. Move it up a little closer here. Then I added water, and I started to get this effect with it and I've added water to this same side too. This one I didn't put the color on as dark. You might have to use more layers if you want yours to be a little bit darker. I think I was probably using some of my um, watercolor pencils last night that might be a little bit, a little bit better than Crayola, but you can get this effect with Crayola if you add more to it. Then, now that it's dry, I wanna look at my picture again here just to see. Um, I wanna start adding scales to it. And if you look at that picture, you can see how the scales are done with lines. Now, not straight across lines. You don't want straight across lines because it won't look like it's rounded. And we know the this, this sea snake is rounded. So when you start doing the scales, you want to start doing make sure that's coming through. Yes, you want to start doing rounded lines. Then you come back the other way. You curve it the other way. If you use straight lines, it's not going to look like a rounded snake. You 
these I need to change a little bit because they need to come over. Let's see. I need to start crisscrossing. So you need this kind of a crisscross look if you want that to be rounded and dimensional and more real looking. So the pieces that I have that have dried, I would start doing that same thing. I wouldn't say to go ahead and do this while this is wet because you'll end up putting a hole right through your paper, which is really not what you want to have happen. because when you come back and you dampen this again, if you come back in, and this one got a little funny because I tried using a dry pencil when it was wet, and I thought, uh-oh, I shouldn't have done that. But if you come back in with your wet brush, all of this gets wet again. So that's why I like to do something with the wet, and then I come back in and I add some dry detail. I also might want to add a little more shading here and there. If I want that shadow to look a little bit different, I can come back in with a dry pencil and add a little bit more to it. So that's where I am at with this one. Um, the way that I got this effect was I used the white pencil and the black and I very, very lightly, using my pencil like this, I very, very lightly, see how light it is? And then I put white on top of it. And then when I put the water on it, it makes it like more of a gray color. Then once it was dry, I went back in with my pencil and I outlined this again just so that it would show up well. So both of these parts have had water added to it, but then I came back in when it was dry with a pencil to outline it again. So I still have a lot of small detail to do, like this little gill here that I used water on, and then I need to go back in with my pencil and outline it so it shows up a little bit better. And then I need to do some things with the water, and I'll use the two shades of blue, probably some white where you see the sea foam coming up here. But this, before I do this on my finished one, I'm going to do some practice things probably on that dry paper. And because it's a practice thing, even though the dry paper isn't best for water, I still may put some water on that one just to see the effect before I go in and do this. Because you can't, it, this is not like the kind of paint that you can paint over if you don't like it or if you feel like you've made a mistake. You want to think about this when you're using these. So, so this one is much more involved to do. If you're more comfortable, do something simpler. But they are just really like a snake. And then you get all fancy with the head. You give it teeth. You give it some of these little spikes. I know there's a better word, but I, the word is escaping me. But you can give it little spikes and create something that looks something other than just an ordinary snake. You might want to get really involved and ha draw this one where he is eating the crew member on the ship. I don't know, that one is pretty advanced, so I'm gonna leave it up to you. So that's our second class here. Um, I'm still writing my story about that egg. I've been thinking a story should have a conflict in it to make it interesting. And to me, the conflict might be, if I wanna to try to hatch that egg, well, first I need to find out instructions, and I found some in one of those books. But if I hatch it, then what? Is that a good idea to try to bring a dragon back? I don't know. Let me know some of your thoughts if you want to send those to me. I'd be, be very interested. So until next class time, happy dragon, happy dragon tales to you. Can't find my signs again. I need a personal assistant.